This is the video for lecture two, where we'll be talking about measurement and calculations. So we're going to start by talking about how we describe measurements. And there's two big uh, descriptors that we use when we're talking about measurements. Those descriptors are accuracy and precision. Now, these two terms are used interchangeably a lot in common speech, but they're actually not the same thing. So accuracy describes how close the value is to the true value, how close your measurement is to the true value. So for example, in this up uh, top da dartboard, dartboard A, all of the darts are pretty close to the bullseye, whereas in dartboard B, all the darts are pretty far away from it. So the darts in dart A, or in dartboard A, we would say are closer and therefore more accurate. Now, as you can imagine, the definition of what qualifies as accurate or inaccurate really depends on the context. So how accurate do you need to be? How accurate can you be, et cetera? But for this class, we'll have a working definition. But if, it, if a measurement is within plus or minus 1% of the true value, we're going to call it accurate. Now, precision is something very different than accuracy. Precision is a question of how repeatable is our measurement. So you'll notice in dartboard B, all the darts are clumped right next to each other, really close together. And so we would actually say that the dart thrower for dartboard B is more precise than the one in dartboard A. Because in dartboard B, all the darts are really close together. A repeatable throwing process going on there. Right? Whereas in dartboard A, they're all spread apart. So the darts in dartboard A are more accurate, but less precise than the darts in dartboard B. And then of course, dartboard C is just all over the place. Now we express our precision as a range. So for example, 110 plus or minus 1.1 pounds. Now where would we get something like that? Well, if you take two measurements of something, and the first measurement says it's 108.9 pounds, and the second says it's 111.1 pounds, then we could say that the average value of that is 110, and the range is 1.1. So it's 1.1 pounds, either above or below that average. Right? You'll notice that the difference between 111.1 and 108.9 is actually 2.2. So this is the range on either direction of the average. For this class, we'll call something precise if it's got a range of less than plus or minus 1%. Right? And, and as you can imagine, precision depends on context as well. So some applications need higher precision than this. Some need it, um, less precision. And so this value, 110 plus or minus 1.1 pounds, 1.1 is 1% 1 of 110, power of 110, sorry. So we would say that that is not precise because it's not less than 1%. It's right at 1%, so it's not precise. But something like 110.0 plus or minus 0 0.5 pounds, that has a deviation of 0.45%, and we would call that precise. So let's practice with this idea a little bit. Here's an eye clicker quiz for you. Several lab groups measure the concentration of NaNO2 in an unknown solution four times. The correct value was 2.20%. So there's 2.20% NaNO2 in the solution. Which group's data is precise, but not very accurate? Let's go ahead and look at those data and try and figure this one out. Go ahead and pause the video. All right. So the first group of data, 2.19, 2.21, 2.20, and 2.19, the average of all those values is pretty close to 2.20. It's within 1%, so it's accurate. The question is asking for which data set is not very accurate. All right, so it's not that one because it is accurate and it's actually fairly precise. This next data set, 2.01, 2.69, 2.14, 1.97. All right, we're asking which group's data is precise. This data 
might actually be accurate. The average might be close to 2.2, um, but the precision is terrible, right? Going from 2.01 to 2.69, and actually all the way down to 1.97, huge range of measurements here. So that's not precise. This bottom one, same issue. We're going from 1.9% to 2.75%. A lot of uh, range there, so not very precise. Now for C, we have 2.11, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11. So we have a precision of less than 1%. All these values are within 1% of each other. Right now we're calculating percent to percent, which is fine. Um, but they aren't very accurate because the average is about 2.10 here and the actual value is 2.20, right? So it's, it's, it's C. So if multiple measurements are taken, you should compare the average value to the true value, gauge your accuracy, and you could, should compare the values to one another, the measured values to one another to determine precision. All right, so we've talked about accuracy and precision in the measurement. Now let's talk about another super important part of a measurement. I'm going to illustrate this point by looking at this granite rock. I took this rock and I carefully measured it and found that it was 1.256. What's the problem with that statement? The problem is it didn't actually express anything useful. 1.256 what? What physical properties did I measure? Uh, am I saying that it has a mass of 1.256 grams? It has a length of 1.256 centimeters? Am I giving you something about the heat capacity? You don't know because I didn't tell you. And so that 1.256 number is completely useless. So for the rest of your career in science, in all of your classes, you should remember every number should have units with it. Sometimes that unit can be a little longer written out. So for example, you could say I had three tennis balls, and then tennis balls would be your unit, right? But every number should have a unit that describes what you're talking about. Okay. And then, so with numbers, having units, this isn't a trivial thing. Most of the time, you know, the world doesn't end, but occasionally this does cause catastrophic issues. For example, uh, in 1983, uh, Air Canada Flight 143, which uh, was a Boeing 767, was flying from Canada to, I think, New York. They almost ran out of fuel and crashed midway. And so why did that happen? Well, because a mechanic wrote down a number without giving units. And this was during a time when they were converting or changing which units they were using. They were going from pounds per liter to kilograms per liter of fuel. Because the uh, mechanic didn't write down which units they, they were using, the person filling the plane didn't know which units to fill or to use to fill. They filled the wrong uh, amount, so they filled too little. Uh, and so the plane ran out of fuel. Another example uh, is in 1999, NASA tried to launch a probe to Mars, but failed miserably. The probe crashed into the ground and hundreds of millions of dollars. So about $125 million in spacecraft plus the cost of the rocket to get it into space and uh, some other factors. This thing crashed and burned. Why? Because uh, scientists, failed to convert from English units to metric units. Oh, sorry. So these conversions and these units describing our numbers are really important. Because they're so important, scientists have come up with a standard set of units. These are called psi units. Psi, or SI, is short for the French term system or système international. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't uh, know anything about French, but that just is French for international system of units. So these units, these psi units, include kilograms for mass. We use the meter to measure length. We use Kelvin to measure temperature. The second to measure time. The ampere to measure electric current. And we use the mole to measure the quantity of the substance. Now you're probably not super familiar with all of these units. And so we'll go through a few of them today. 
few of them next time to get you a little more familiar with. Them. Now, there's actually a big problem with using standard units like this. So, for example, using the meter to measure everything in, in terms of length. And I'll give you an example of why that is. So let's say you're trying to measure the distance to the moon. Well, that's about 380 million meters. And the distance to your apartment, well, let's say you live half a mile away, that's about 1,000 meters. The average height of a person, 1.5 meters. And the length of your thumb is 0 0.05 meters. And the distance between a hydrogen and oxygen atom in a water molecule is about 0 0.0000000001 meters. Now, if it wasn't clear what the problem is until that last one, I hope that last one really clarified it. Saying all these zeros and numbers just isn't convenient. It's not practical. It takes up time. It takes up space. And it's real easy to make mistakes when writing tons and zeros over and over again. So we put prefixes on these numbers to indicate how many zeros basically are there. So for example, we can turn 380 million meters to 0 0.38 gigameters. And that's a lot easier to write down. It's a lot easier to keep straight and not make mistakes. And this distance between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms in a water molecule, we can change that to just 0 0.1 nanometers. I'm gonna give you now the list of prefixes. You need to memorize all of these. You'll notice that they are all just multiples of 10. So for example, a K right here, which stands for kilo, just stands for 1,000. So if we're talking about one kilogram, we're talking about 10 to the third or 1,000 grams. And this notation of 10 to some power is also uh, a, a, a unit of expression that you're going to have to get familiar with as well. So 10 to the third means that there's a one with three zeros uh, in front or behind it. 10 to the one means 10, so one with one zero. 10 to the minus third means that there's a one with three zeros in front of it, so 0 0.001, okay? Get familiar with that. If, you're, if you struggle with that, then make sure to practice it, okay? But like I said, go ahead and make sure to memorize all of these sci units. You can come up with some sort of acronym like the great mighty King Henry died. Uh, that helps. And it helps too because above this G, there's actually a T. It stands for Terra, right? Getting into the terabyte age of computers now. Um, but go ahead and do your best. Come up with an acronym or something to measure it. The only one of these that is kind of strange is the micro, which is symbolized by the Greek letter mu rather than a Latin letter. And, and that one is fun. <laughs> Actually, like that one. All right, so that's uh, prefixes. Now let's talk about temperatures. I said that the standard unit for temperature is the Kelvin, but most of us have never used Kelvin before coming to a chemistry class or science class. We've either used degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius, depending on where you're from. And the US, we use degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in most other places, they use degrees Celsius. And then I don't know of any country that uses Kelvin, uh, but in science, we use Kelvin a lot because it's a lot more useful than degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll take this point, this moment actually, to point something out. You'll notice that the degrees Fahrenheit has a degree symbol. Degrees Celsius also has a degree symbol, but Kelvin does not. We actually don't talk about degrees Kelvin, we talk about Kelvin. The reason we like Kelvin so much is it's an absolute scale. The other temperature uh, measurements are not. So what I mean by that is zero Kelvin is equivalent to absolute zero. It means that, uh, that at zero Kelvin, there's no energy, there's no motion, there's nothing. Right, the corresponding value in degrees Celsius is negative 273 degrees Celsius, and in Fahrenheit, it's negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, of course, Celsius is uh, derived from the melting point and boiling point of water, so zero degrees Celsius is the melting point 
and 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point, and then it's just extrapolated in either direction from there. And then degrees Fahrenheit, I always forget where that came from. It's like sticking a thermometer in a dead horse or something like that is, is zero. Or, I, I don't even remember. It's kind of, <laughs> but it's, it doesn't really matter. What matters though is that you're going to have to be able to convert from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius to Kelvin. Now going from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius is not hard. You just use this equation right here. So you take degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 and you times it by five nights. And that's an exact conversion that'll get you into the right place in degrees Celsius. Once you're in degrees Celsius, you have to add 273.15 your degree Celsius to get your value into Kelvin. A lot of times you'll hear us in this class just say add 273 because we don't need to be as accurate or accurate enough that we need to keep that 0.15 on there. So a lot of times you'll hear people just add 273. All right. Next, we're going to talk about whether our measured value is an exact number or if we use some mechanism for measuring, okay? Give you an example of what I mean. How many ping pong balls do you see here? I see one, two, three. That's an exact value. There's not 3.17, there's three. And we know it's an exact number because we counted it. So exact numbers are always counted, right? But measured numbers, are by their name, you can figure out a measure. So for example, if I'm measuring a piece of wood, I stick it up next to a ruler, and this right here, it looks like it's 3.0 centimeters long. And you say, okay, we measured that. We got 3.0 centimeters, that's great, we measured it. But there's a little bit of a difference between exact numbers and measured numbers. Measured numbers always come with some amount of uncertainty. And you're thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? I'm pretty certain that piece of wood is three centimeters long. Okay, I'll agree with you. It is 3.0 centimeters long. But what decimal comes after that zero? Let's zoom in on this wood and ruler here. You'll notice the wood comes just past that 3.0 mark. Doesn't come up to the 3.1 uh, centimeter mark. So we know the wood is somewhere between 3.0 and 3.1 but we don't have any lines in between there indicating how close it is. Now we know it, that saying something like it's 3.03 .03 centimeters will be more accurate than saying it's 3.09 centimeters because it's clearly closer to the 3.0 line than to the 3.1 line. But we are guessing a little bit exactly how far into that 3.0 area we're at, right? And so when we're measuring, Almost always when we're measuring, we have some amount of certainty for some numbers, and then the last digit in our number, so whether it's a two or a three or a four, is a bit of a guess. And even when we're having an instrument measure this, it's still a bit of a guess. So the final digit always contains some amount of small error, and it's what we call the least significant digit. And you'll notice that we don't keep adding decimals after this. We, we can't say that it's 3.03175 centimeters, right? That'd be just wildly silly. And so this gets us into the idea of significant figures. Significant figures is a set of rules that describes what number you can put on your piece of paper or what number you can report. Okay. And basically with significant figures is you want to put all your known digits, so that 3.0 plus your one estimated digit at the, last, at the end, so 3.03 .03 centimeters. Now, sometimes you'll only have an estimated digit, and that's fine. Sometimes you'll have a bunch of known digits, and that's fine as well. Um, but the key takeaway is that measurements can't be reported better than the uncertainty of the estimated digit. And you're asking yourself, okay, I don't really see how this plays into real life. Well, let me give you an example of something I found just the other day. I had a better example or an example I liked better because I'm not a huge fan of olives. But the other day I was eating olives, even though I didn't like them. Um, and on the bottle, I was eating some olives with garlic pits 
in the middle, so the pits have been replaced with garlic. And the bottle said that there were 20 calories in one olive or 30 calories in two olives. So what's going on here? Are these olives having some sort of calorie sale where I'm gonna eat fewer calories if I eat more olives somehow? No, that's not what's going on at all. What's probably going on, and there's a little bit of guesswork here, but it's pretty good guesswork. What's probably going on is that each olive has something like 15 plus or minus 10 calories. And why such a big range? Well, because olives can come in different sizes, right? You have little tiny olives, you can have bigger olives. And obviously there's some average there, but scientists probably just weren't able to measure the exact number of calories in each olive very well. So 15 plus or minus 10, it's not very precise, right? And because of that, we don't have a ton of confidence in this five. And there's actually laws surrounding this. And they would say that you have to round that 15 because this uh, precision is so bad, you have to round it to the nearest whole number. So this 15 would round to 20 calories. Okay, that makes sense to some extent. But then if you eat two olives, 15 times two is now 30. You still have just as much uncertainty in this 30 number as you did in 20, but we can round it to 30 instead of a 40. Now, this seems somewhat arbitrary right now. And so we'll get into the actual rules for significant figures. Now, the first thing you gotta do is learn how to count significant figures. So say, how many of my digits in my number are significant? How many of my figures do I care about? The first rule is pretty easy. Everything that's not zero is significant, right? So if you have a four, a seven, those are significant. If you have a zero, you're just in trouble. <laughs> that's a joke. But uh, zeros do get pretty complicated. If a zero is in between two other numbers, then it's always significant. If zeros are in front, or what we call leading zeros, if they're in front of the other numbers, they're not significant. If they're trailing zeros, so if it's after uh, other numbers, then it is significant, except for when it's not significant. <laughs> okay, now this is where we get into some ambiguity with significant figures, and I'll tell you how to deal with it in a sec. We call this zero in the nine zero significant because it comes after a decimal place or because there's a decimal place there. So trailing zeros are significant when there's a decimal place in the number. These placeholding zeros are not significant because there's no decimal. And I'll explain why that why we would even get placeholding zeros in a second. But if we want to indicate that those are significant, that we actually measured those zeros, we'd put a decimal place there. And now all of a sudden they're significant. Okay. Let's talk about zeros now. Let's try and weed out why some zeros are significant, some are not, why some trailing zeros are significant and why some are not, okay? And then we'll, I'll give you a rule or some, some ideas on how to deal with some of these ambiguities. All right, but let's start with a ruler. When you use a ruler, you place this zero up against the bottom of the thing, right? You start at zero. And then you try and measure to the top of the thing or whichever dimension you're dealing with. Right? Let's say you measure up to 0 0.07 centimeters. Okay, so your thing is, whatever you're measuring is pretty small. Did you actually measure these first two zeros in this number? I would say you didn't, right? You started at 0, 0.00, you only changed this last digit to a seven, right? So you, oh, so you didn't measure those zeros. So they're not significant. You don't get to count them as significant figures. Well, let's say now you started at zero and you measured something that's 10.50 centimeters long. Did you measure these zeros? Of course you did, right? You have to have those numbers there to describe uh, the value you measured, right? You didn't measure 10.51 centimeters. You measured 10.50 centimeters. And you didn't measure 10.501 centimeters, you just measured 10.50. Well, 
So these guys all get to be significant. Okay, now let's go back to this 0 0.07 centimeter meter. Let's say you did measure that and 0 0.07 centimeters isn't in units you like. So you want to convert that to micrometers because everything else you're working with that day is in micrometers. So if we convert from centimeters to micrometers, we go from 0 0.07 to 700. Now, did we measure these zeros at the end of 700 micrometers? Absolutely not, right? They just came as a result of math. We defined that a micrometer has so many centimeters in it, or sorry, that centimeters have so many micrometers in it, and we did a mathematical conversion. It's not actually based on a measurement. So these zeros, because we didn't measure them, are not significant. But what if we had a case where we had the seven on the first zero significant. What are we going to do there? Well, we'll get to that. Okay, but first let's let's practice a little bit with sig figs. So we'll go through these numbers, and then this video I'll go through them fairly quickly. But go ahead and pause the video right now. Try and figure out how many of how many sig figs are in each number. All right, for eight hundred, there's one sig fig. Right, these trailing zeros. We can't say they're significant because there's no decimal points. In 101.02, there's one, two, three, four, five significant figures. The zeros are significant because they're captured by the other numbers. All right, 0 0.00670. Here we have multiple types of zeros. We have leading zeros, which are not significant. And we have a trailing zero. Is it significant or not? It is because there's a decimal point in the number. So six point or six seven zero are our three significant figures. How about the year 2050, the year the aliens invade? All right, we have a trapped zero, which is going to be significant, and a trailing zero, which is not significant because we don't have a decimal place, right? But then what about 10.0? We have two trailing zeros, but we also have a decimal point, so they're significant, so there's three. 0 0.0023, we got three leading zeros, which aren't significant, and the two and the three are significant. Here we've got 30,050, so we've got two captured zeros and a trailing zero. The captured zeros are significant, the trailing is not, so we get four sig figs. In 314, we get three sig figs because those are all non zeros. In 760.000, we've added that decimal point indicate that we measured all three of these zeros and this other zero for the decimal point. So we have six six figs there. And then in 500, somebody added a decimal point there to indicate that those trailing zeros are significant. We have three decimal or three six figs. All right. So we talked about how do I count them. Now what happens when I need to do math with them? What happens when I need to add two numbers. So if I had, a, had to add 800 and 10.0, 800 only has one sig fig, 10.0 has three, all right? So what do we, how do we deal with that? There's two sets of rules. There's one for addition and subtraction and a separate set for multiplication and division, all right? You're gonna need to know these. When you're adding or subtracting numbers, the answer, gets the same number of decimal places as the number or the measured value with the fewer decimal places. How does this work? We have 125 plus 315. These both have three decimal places and they both end at the ones place. So neither of them have any decimals. But if we add them together, we get 440. Now that zero though, we need to indicate is significant because these both have, uh, have numbers in the ones place. So we need to put that decimal there to say that 440 point or 440 point grams is what we have. What if we subtract 613 minus 582.1? Well, the actual value here would not be 31 grams, right? It would be 30.9 grams. But because we don't have that many decimals in 613, we have to round to the ones place. Now, why do we get, or why do we do that? 
Well, because we don't actually know if this is 613 grams or if it's 613.1 or if it's 612.7, right? We just don't know. And so all this is a way of dealing with things we don't know about. Right, so 0 0.004 minus 0 0.0002 grams, right? When or all is said and done, is just going to be 0 0.004 grams. I haven't made a big enough subtraction there to make a measurable difference. And then these last numbers, you'll notice the first has four decimal places, the second has three, and the last has four. So the answer can only have three decimal places. All right, go ahead and try this out. Uh, here's a question for you. What is the answer with the correct number of sig figs? 2.335 seconds plus 33.20 seconds plus 6.1 seconds. What is that? Go ahead and pause the video and figure it out. All right, now if you're clever, you can actually answer this question without doing any math because all of the answers have different numbers of decimal places. And the first measured value has three decimal places, the second has two, and the last has one. So we know we're going to need the answer with one decimal place because that's the measured value with the fewest number of decimal places. Now, of course, if you just entered all this into your calculator, you'd get A, 41.635 as seconds. I left them to talk all this shame, shame, Dr. Um, but uh, your calculator doesn't know how to do sig figs. Okay, and it's going to be on you, and it's going to be a part of every single question uh, involving numbers from here on out. All right. Now for multiplication and division, the rule is slightly different, okay? Here, you're just going to count the number of sig figs in each of the measured values. And your answer can have the same number of significant figures as the measured value with the fewest sig figs, right? So if I'm taking 85 times 34, that's going to be 2,900 grams, or cubic grams. <laughs> But uh, I don't get to call these last two zeros significant. Why? Because I only get two significant figures because my measured values over here each only had two significant figures. So if I have these next two, 6.31 times 3.536, those come out to be 22.3 grams, right? Why is that? Well, I, you'll notice that I started with two decimal places and three decimal places, but only ended with one. Why? Because we don't care about decimal places with multiplication and division. We care a lot about decimal places with addition and subtraction. Don't care at all with multiplication and division. With multiplication and division, we care about number of sig figs. Okay. So here we started with three sig figs and four sig figs. So our answer can only have three. And then this last value of 25.34 divided by this big number, or this really tiny number, gets us 163,000. You'll notice that even though uh, this number is way bigger than either of those, we started with four decimal, or sorry, four sig figs and three sig figs. And so our answer can only have three sig figs. Now, when you're doing these calculations, you should always carry all of your, all of your digits through all of your calculations. So if there's multiple steps, um, when there's multiple steps, figuring out sig figs does become complicated, but you shouldn't round anything until you finish the last calculation step. All right, so let's practice with multiplication. What is the answer with the correct number of sig figs? Go ahead and pause your video and try it out. All right, now again, if you're clever, you can get away without actually doing any math here. You can just count the number of sig figs. And this one is three, and the sig figs in this one is four. So your answer has to have three sig figs. So it's going to be C. Okay. Of course, with when you're actually doing math yourself, you're going to have to do put it in the calculator and then figure out how many sig figs and then round them, et cetera. All right. Now, we talked about some ambiguity, right? 
how do we know if trailing zeros are significant? Well, you can add a period, but what if you have 700 micrometers, but only one of those zeros, the first zero is significant? You can't express that with the rules I have taught you so far. That's where we turn to something called scientific notation. So in scientific notation, we only include significant digits, and then we multiply that by a factor of 10 to some power. So here, 7.20 times 10 to the third would be 7,200 units. All right, right? So this three indicates that we'll move this decimal in place one, two, three places to the right, right, to get this 7,200 mils. Now, if you look at this number, then we can only say there's two sig figs, right? But if you look at the scientific notation, there's three. So in scientific notation, it's easier to express which trailing zeros are significant and which are not. So the benefit is the number of sig figs is always clear. So there's no ambiguity and we know how certain uh, we know that number. All right, so for example, what is 1.0 times 10 to the eight meters in standard form? Well, that is one times one with eight zeros, so 100 million meters. If you look at this number again, you'd only be able to say there's one significant figure, but in the scientific notation, we're able to express that there's actually two. So we actually measured that first zero after the one, and all these other ones are just placeholder ones. Now, what if we have a number that's less than one, so 0 0.002783 grams? Well, in this case, we're going to have to use a negative exponent. So that would be 2.783 times 10 to the negative third grams. So converting that from scientific notation to regular notation, we'd go one, two, three places to the left with the decimal place. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about today is dimensional analysis. And that's converting a quantity to an equivalent amount in different units. So if we're trying to go from 60 minutes to one hour, what we're going to do is come up with a conversion factor, which expresses the same value just in different units, right? So if you take 60 minutes divided by one hour, that's equal to one because 60 minutes equals one hour, right? But let's say that we wanted to go from grams to kilograms. So we'd say 163 grams times some conversion factor, which would be one kilogram, per 1,000 grams, and that's just the definition of a kilogram. And then we carry that math through and find that we get our desired value of 163 kilograms. Now, when we're doing this, the steps that we did was this. So we wrote the given number that we have, and then we write out the final number that we want. And then we find the conversion factors that we need. And then what we're gonna do is cancel out units to make sure we get the right answer. So these grams will cancel out. We will be left in kilograms, and then we will calculate the answer at the very end. So let's practice uh, really quickly with figuring out how many seconds are in 1.92 days. That's roughly the amount of time between the end of lecture on Wednesday and the beginning of lecture on Friday. Well, we're trying to go from days to seconds, so we're gonna need to come up with some conversion factors, all right? So we'll have to multiply days by hours per day, and then hours per day by minutes per hour, and then minutes per hour times seconds per minute, right? So if we do it this way, you'll notice that the days cancel each other, the hours cancel each other, the minutes cancel each other, and we're left only with seconds, and we get this value of 165,888 seconds. All right, we're there, right? No. If you put that number on an assignment, on a test, on a quiz, you just lost points. Why? What, what's wrong with that number? You did all the math right. You didn't think about sig figs, right? How many sig figs do we get? Well, in 1.92 days, there's three, 24 hours, 60 minutes and 60 seconds, there's two. And on the bottom here, there's one sig fig. Uh, actually, that's not quite right. How many sig figs? are in 24 hours for one day. Well, 24.000 hours is also equal to 1.000 days, right? 
60.00 minutes is also equal to 1.00 hours. What I'm trying to get at is with defined numbers like this, we actually have an infinite number of significant figures because one day is defined as exactly 24 hours, one hour is defined as exactly 60 minutes, one minute is defined as exactly 60 seconds. So all of these conversion factors, when they're defined like that, you don't lose any significant figures. You will lose significant figures in some conversion factors, like when you're going from pounds to kilograms, because that's not a defined conversion factor. We measured one pound and then weighed it in kilograms and figured out how much that was. But in this case, the only sig figs are coming from the 1.92. So we only get three sig figs in our answer. Our answer would be 166,000 seconds. There's a one last practice problem for you. So a patient requires 0.012 grams of a painkiller available as a 15 milligram per mil solution. How many milliliters should be given? So in other words, how many milliliters of this 15 milligram per mil solution do you need to deliver to get 0.012 grams? I've given you a little hint here that you're gonna need Oh, that should say one gram equals 1,000 milligrams, not milliliters. Um, but go ahead and try and figure this one out. Go ahead and pause the video. All right, so you should have gotten an answer of 0 0.8 milliliters. Because the first thing you do is you convert your 0 0.012 grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams per gram. And then we'll multiply by this, or this factor that there's one mil or 15 milligrams, which is the inverse of 15 milligrams per mil. And that will tell us that we need 0.8 mils.